there's not a big difference between the time of Jahiliyyah and many of the things that we find around us now. So, one of the uh, things that I wanted to do was look at Jahiliyyah before the Prophet ﷺ came. What was the state of the Arabs? So that Allah decided to send Muhammad وسلم, to straighten these people, to show them the right way. Now after Ismail the, uh, his progeny, they continue, his children, those that lived in Mecca, those that lived in that area, they continued on Tawheed. They believed in Allah and they worshipped Allah as Allah commanded. They used to make Hajj, they used to make Tawaf, they used to do these things. And they were on La ilaha illallah. Until one man from among the Arabs, this one man, uh, Amr ibn Luhay, he traveled on some business, Allah alam, for some reason. And when he traveled, he found people worshipping idols. He found people worshipping idols and they said that, you know, he's, he's, he finds this strange. You know, we worship one God. Our father, Ismail alayhi salam, and through him we've learned to worship one God. Allah azza wa That's it. And he found this strange that they're worshipping idols. He asked them, what is this that you're doing? And they said that these idols, we, we, we make dua to them. We ask them for rain, they give us rain. He says, really? They say, yes. He says, we ask them for help, they give us help, they, they give us strength. We win in our battles, we win in our fights. He said, is this true? They said, yes, we, we've, uh, ex you know, we've experimented, we've tried it, we've tested this over years. These idols, they give us rain, and they give us help, and they give us support, they give us aid. And so he said, well, can you give me one of the idols to take back with me? And so this one man was the cause of the introduction of idol worship into the uh, Arabian Peninsula according to all that part in, in Mecca according to some of the historians so you've got an environment now which used to be a pure clean environment of Tawheed but now it becomes a, 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 an environment of Shirk and then these idols not to, from the one that he brought it turns into hundreds of idols if not thousands Allah added the number so then people start making their own idols and making them out of stone, out of rock. Somehow, we know the hadith about from, even from Tamar. Huh? <laughs> even from dates. And when they go hungry, they eat the dates, subhanAllah. So some even, they say, there's uh, narrations that they made pictures of what they thought was Ibrahim salam, and Ismail salam, and they put them in the Kaaba. So all sorts of, you can see people making up deen, people making up religion. And remember, we're trying to look at the similarities between then and now. It's the same thing we have now. People making up religion. I think you can get close to God in this way, and I think you can do that. And in this society that we live in, there's people making up deen all the time. Huh? This uh, thing that we know, which is called Christianity around us, this is nothing like what was called Christianity even when I was a child. <laughs> this is nothing like the Christianity of 50 years ago, 100 years ago. So there's these constant changes in, in deen for these people, not for us, alhamdulillah. So we looked at the religion. So we look at how shirk is spreading, is widespread. And not only shirk, but okay, what else is happening? Um, again, th these are not hadith, these are from the historians. This, so we, you don't apply the same kind of burden of proof as we do to hadith. But some of the scholars of tarikh, they said that uh, how did the, the killing of daughters begin? So we're looking at the evils, we're looking at the, the time. They said that the, uh, there was a tribe, there was a Qawm and Rabi'ir. And amongst the Arabs, when, you, when they attacked another tribe, when they you know, uh, were victorious against them, they would give the women a choice. Said so either the women were allowed to stay with their tribe, and they would be taken as slaves, whatever, or they could come. And, and be with the, the tribe that is victorious, the one that attacked them and, and has won. Now it said that this tribe, Rabir, the leader of this tribe, his daughter, she chose to go to the uh, side that had attacked them and had won. And so this was a great source of shame for him. Great source of shame. And so he said that, I, uh, you know, after this, I don't want any daughters. And it said that after this he had more than 10 daughters and every single one he killed. 
every single daughter he killed because of that disgrace that came upon him from his daughter. And those that saw him from his, his own people, they started doing the same and then this spread as well. And even though, you know, not all the Arabs were doing this, and many amongst the elite, they didn't used to practice this. But many of them did. And it became again widespread, this evil. And then we look at the evil of abortion in our times, how it's become just, you know, people don't even think about it. These things are happening constantly. One of the Sahaba, he said that in Jahiliya, he said to his wife one day, you know, get our daughter ready, dress her up. I want to take her to visit my relatives, our relatives. And he said, my wife, she feared that I might do something evil. So she made me promise that I won't do anything evil with our daughter. And I gave her my word. Then we set out. And at, on our way, I saw a well. And when I saw this well, you know, I thought about my ghira, that this, my honor and my dignity, and that this girl could cause me to lose my honor and dignity. And so I wanted her to throw her in the well. I looked at her and she said to me, Father, don't forget the promise that you made to our mother, to, to my mother. Don't break your promise. And he said, so I, I had second thoughts. Then I looked at the well and I thought about my honor again. Then I looked at my daughter and she starts crying. And I felt mercy. Then I looked at the well and that feeling overtook me. I took her and I threw her in the well. And I could hear her voices, her screaming, her shouting, until she died. So we look at the, the greatest of sins, the shirk that exists there. Then we look at this, the killing of their own children. Grown children, live children. Huh? Okay, now we have the abortion. Is Most of the time it's with unborn. But subhanAllah, what was going on then? Like, uh, zina. It was widespread. They used to have four different types of marriage. But they weren't marriage, it was zina. One of them was the, the type of marriage that we have now. One of them was where a husband, he says to his wife, go and get pregnant from someone else. And when you get pregnant, come back. Another one was where a woman, she's with different people. She will choose different people, she'll be with all of them. And when, she's, has, when she falls pregnant, she picks one and says, you're the father. They had all these kinds of, you know, disgusting things, dirty things going on. They would make haram halal and halal haram. They, they, they would say that if a camel, she gave birth to female camels, 10 females camels, it's haram now. They would cut the ears as a, and make it like marked that you shouldn't eat this camel now. Allah Azza wa in uh, Surah Al-Jinn, He says, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَزَادُهُمْ رَحَقًا Allah Azza wa tells us, SubhanAllah, in, at that time, things have become so bad that if they were traveling and they were, they were in a valley and they have to stop, they fear the evil of the valley. So the big jinn of that valley, they would ask for protection from him. So instead of asking Allah Azza wa for help from the evil, from the shayateen and from the animals and whatever shadow there is there, they, they, they seek refuge in the big jinn of that valley. Now, SubhanAllah, in the time where all of this evil, this shar exists, what does Allah Azza wa choose as the solution? The Quran and the Sunnah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He sends the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He get, reveals to him the Quran. And the Sunnah is also revelation. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't act, didn't speak of his own desires. He didn't make things up. So my point was, right at the beginning, the, the Muslim's role, the Muslim's uh, behavior is always the same. There, there should be no difference between what the Prophet وسلم, came with and what was right then and what we should be doing now. Hmm? Are you clear on this? There should be no difference. Islam doesn't change. This is why the, the non-Muslims, they, they find it so difficult to understand. How can you Muslims follow a book which is 1400 years old? How can you Muslims stop clean your teeth with a stick? He used to do it 1400 years ago, forget it now. How can you Muslims raise your garments above your ankles? They don't understand this. Because for them, they think that as time goes by, everything get, gets better. Everything gets better. 
We used to do things in a bad way before we teach better now. More, our practices are better now. Everything we improve. But for a Muslim, we don't have that mindset. We don't believe that. Some things, yes. Some things, fine. My old phone was rubbish. This phone is better. <laughs> okay, and that I'll accept it. But the laws of Allah from 1400 years ago were the best and most appropriate, and they still are. There's no new law you can come with which is better than the Sharia of Allah Azzawajal. So we have to get that right, that understanding. Not everything new is better than that which was old. Okay, so then Allah Azzawajal sent the Prophet This man, this human being, who had the best character, the best morals, the best adab, the best akhlaq that anyone has ever seen. And this one man, just as that one man before, Amr ibn Luhay, brought in shirk into, the, into Mecca and he took however, however many people to Jahannam with him. Then this one man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bi'idhnillah, he changed, forget just Mecca, he changed the, the planet. He's changed this planet, subhanAllah. He has taken billions, inshaAllah, to Jannah. He, he has become a source of guidance for millions upon millions of mankind. And so, the role of the Muslim in the West now is to be as the Prophet was in his time. Now, all of us know this. You knew this before you came here. I didn't need to tell you this. Yeah? But we need reminders. That's one thing. But another thing that we need to look at is how do we practically do that? The first thing is every single one of us has to be on this journey now to become like the Prophet ﷺ. The fathers, the mothers, the children, everyone has different things that they need to be doing. And same things that we all need to be doing. We all need to be praying like the Prophet ﷺ. We all need to start understanding the importance of Salah and the Afkar and the du'as for protection, the morning and evening afkar, all these things, these all of us need to do. The children need to learn respect for their elders, respect for their parents, and giving rights to their parents, etc, etc. The parents need to take the responsibility of nurturing their children on the deen, seriously, and, and discharging that duty properly. So there's all of these things. Now then, we come to certain specific things to the West then. Um, and again, when you think about it, they're not really specific to the West. In, I used to teach in a, uh, a center, a tuition center in uh, Deptford. And uh, in that center, there's a lot of uh, Muslim children whose parents have come to this country recently. Some are from the Somalian background, some are from different backgrounds. But I was speaking to one of these, these boys one day, one day, and he's telling me that he's, you know, about this program he watches on TV. Uh, and this program is not a very good program. And Alhamdulillah, I never watched this program, but I know the reputation of this program. And it's on at 11 at night, and the boy's 10. And I'm asking him, how comes you watch this? He says, that's, you know, it's on, we watch it. And then, you know, we, then obviously uh, we took the matter further, and it turns out that, subhanAllah, because the parents, they, they've come from abroad, they were living in Dubai for a while, and then they came here, they don't know programs this disgusting, this dirty, are on TV. They don't know things that this bad can be on TV because they, they were grow, grew up in Somalia, then they went to Dubai, they still stayed in the Middle East. They don't have programs like this on there. They never saw things like this before. So they didn't find that children are watching TV, it's okay. They don't realize what's going on. So as the role of the Muslim parent in this society is to be aware of what is going on out there. I'm teaching at school, so we come across issues that Parents, even I didn't know, existed. Because when I was young in this country, these things didn't happen. Now, the children, the parents, they want to make their children happy, you've been a good boy. Okay, mashallah, you get your smartphone. We found out, you know, boys, some boys, they're coming to school, they're tired. They can't stay up in lesson. Why? We found out the boys, they're, they're BBMing each other at night time. <laughs> boys, alhamdulillah, it's boys between boys, they're just joking with each other. Huh? And they're not falling asleep. So we said, Falas, you know, it's, it's a problem, obviously. Then the problem got even more serious. Then it turned out, boys are contacting girls using this. 
Huh? They're sending messages to each other. They're arranging to meet each other. Things are happening, you know, with these devices. So parents need to be aware of what is going on. What are the dangers that are facing uh, their children? And there's these new things coming up that we didn't know. You know, there were so many things that we couldn't do when we were young. There was no internet, you know. There was, uh, the access to these things wasn't available. Now, getting back to this, uh, the positive role of the Muslim in the West. The Muslim cannot be positive, cannot be a positive role model of a Muslim until he's living that Islam. Until he's living that Islam, what we said right at the beginning of the Prophet If we're trying to deal with all these issues, my son is doing this and he's texting that and he's watching this. And, you know, we're, we're sort of dealing, trying to deal with these. It's like they say you're trying to put out little fires. Yeah, and you're trying to put out little fires and there's this huge big fire going on in the background. You're, you're constantly trying to put out these little fires. And you can't do anything else. You can't do anything productive. You can't do any work. So, first and foremost, we need to sort out our family lives uh, and our own being. Mm -hmm. Nobody can be a positive Muslim role model, can be a positive is example of Islam and sustain that unless he sorts out his salah, first of all. Are we praying it properly? Do we, you know, do we make wudu properly? And then once we start doing that, we start thinking and pondering over what we're reading in our salah. Yeah? Then, after that, we move to the next level, where we start doing our sunnah, praying our sunnah, uh, the adhkar, the du'as. Then we look at qiyam al the fasting. If we really look serious about being positive role models, like we saw, like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the sahaba was, we have to be thinking very high. When we say positive role model, we're not just talking about a person who has a beard, he goes out nicely dressed, then I'm a good Muslim. No. A Muslim was what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba were. And to be that, the Salah, the Salah, the Salah, has to be the foundation that we build on. And then we build all these other things around. Our ibadah, our connection with Allah Azza cannot exist without a relationship with the Qur'an, with our Salah, with all these acts of worship, with dhikr. Once we have those things, then we can go out and be even more effective. I'm not saying we wait until we've got that. Obviously, we always do things. We're constantly working. But we need to have all of these things to strengthen ourselves and make us better and better and more effective. Now, there's many Muslims who have the attitude that we are going to live here and we're going to stay away from everyone else. We're going to stay away from everyone else. We're just going to live in our own little uh, masjid and our own schools and our own community. And we'll just live as if we don't actually live in this country. But what we're, the, the title was chosen, what we can do, because you know, the, the idea is that we live amongst the people in this country and we show them the deen, we show them Islam, we show them the beauty of this religion, and we try and guide these people, we try and save them from the hellfire, which was the priority of the Prophet He didn't say, I'm going to run away from this kuffar and, and, and live somewhere in a mountain or somewhere. No. He, he, was, he used to take it upon himself to guide people and save people so much that Allah Azza wa had to console him with the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa had to send down ayat to you know, make him take it easy. SubhanAllah, ma illa bala. That you're only a conveyor of the message. So SubhanAllah, we, we think about our role. And that we have to take this deed to the people around us. SubhanAllah, just uh, last week something happened to me and I felt so ashamed. I felt so ashamed. Because it reminded me of the Prophet ﷺ, but it was a Kafir who did this. A non-Muslim, may Allah guide this person. I, I don't take the bus very often. And I had to take the bus, I, I, could, I, I didn't have a car. So I'm standing at the bus stop waiting for the bus and it's raining. And I had an appointment to meet someone, I'm going from Lucian to Croydon. So I had to get this bus. And it's freezing, you see the weather how it is. I had my two boys with me. The bus came, alhamdulillah, we quickly jumped on the bus. I touched the oyster card which I borrowed, and it's not working. So I said, fine, okay, alhamdulillah. I bought some money, took out five pounds, gave it to the bus driver. He says, I don't have change. Yeah? So, <laughs> I'm still here a bit. 
I said, I'm giving him this five pounds to keep. I said to my boys, come back downstairs. They already ran upstairs. There was a lady waiting at the bus stop in front of me. She got on the bus before me, she went and sat down. When I called my boys down, she uh, said to me, hold on, I've got some change. So she starts looking through her purse, and then she gives me two pounds. So I paid the driver, I went back to her, I gave her the five pounds, I said, look, you know, okay, uh, this is what I've got. She said, no, no, I don't have any more change. So I said, okay, you keep the five pounds, you know? And she wouldn't take it. She's not taking it, subhanAllah. And uh, now I'm feeling terrible, I can't take this money. And subhanAllah, so I said to her, no, no, come on, take the, take the five pounds, it's fine, you know, I, you, you're generous to me. And she's like, no, 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 that's fine. You know, I can't take that, I don't want to take that. It's, you, you keep it, it's fine, don't worry about it. So now I went upstairs, I'm sitting in the bus and I'm just feeling so subhanAllah, <coughs> thinking about this. Alhamdulillah, I found in my other pocket, someone had given me money the other day, and I found in there two pounds. So I take it back down to her. And I say, look, I found the money now. And she's like, no, 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 give it to the boys upstairs. Now the whole bus is looking, now the bus is smiling. <laughs> and I'm saying to her, no, 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 come on, look, I, I found it now. Thank you very much for your generosity. And so then finally she took it. But subhanAllah, you know what? This was the generosity, more than this, obviously, of the Prophet sallallahu And this is how a non-Muslim was towards me. And you can see how, I, how, how we look. You can tell we are Muslim. And you see all the, the, the media, what it says about Islam and the Muslims. And still she was willing to show this generosity, this kindness. And subhanAllah, this is, this is what I was thinking about. That when we talk about positive role model of the, prophet, of the Muslim in the West, it should be exactly the same as the Prophet وسلم, was in his time. He, وسلم, we all know the example of the woman who used to abuse him. And when she's ill, when she's, he goes and visits her, subhanAllah, and she takes her shahada. This is how he was. When people would be swearing at him and using bad language, foul language at him, he wouldn't turn around and use that same language towards them. Hmm? How he looked after his, his, the people around him, how he would, Sahaba, if they were not present, he would miss them. He would ask, where is this person? The, the Sahabi who used to clean the masjid, you think, you know, he's a great leader, he's the Prophet Sallallahu You know, he doesn't think about little people. SubhanAllah, this woman, she used to clean the masjid. And when he doesn't see her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asks, where is she? You know, even everybody he would think of, he would consider, he would miss. And so SubhanAllah, this, this is how we should be. This is what we should have in us. His generosity of always giving. <coughs> when we, SubhanAllah, look at this, Thumamat ibn Uthal radiallahu This was a, a man, a leader from amongst the leaders of the Arabs, who the Prophet sallallahu sent a letter to, calling him to the to Islam, because he was one of the, the the powerful leaders, one of the kings you could say. And straight away he rejects the message of the Prophet sallallahu What is this? And he wants to go and kill the Prophet sallallahu he wants to kill him. And it's said that one of his relatives, he talks him out of going to kill the Prophet So he says, khalas, okay, fine, But he persecuted the Muslims. He was bad to the Muslims. He was, he hated Islam. He wants to go for Umrah one time, for, for Hajj, which they did in their way. And uh, he's captured by the Muslims. He's captured by the Muslims. They take him, they tie him up in Masjid al -Nabwi. When the Prophet ﷺ comes by, he asks the Sahaba, do you know who this is? They say, no. we captured him. He says, this is the man. This is the one whose blood I made halal. The Prophet ﷺ, he made his blood halal. He said, you can kill him. If you find him somewhere, if you come across him, it's permissible for you to kill him. Now, when he's a prisoner and he's tied up in the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ, he says to the Sahaba, treat him well. Treat him nicely. And he went out and he sent food for him from his family. Went home to his family, asked them to get something together, whatever they had, and he sent him good food. And he was treated nicely, with compassion. And they took good care of him. And they kept the Prophet kept approaching him and asking him, Do you, you know, uh, you know, what is it that you want from them? And he kept uh, 
Sumama radiallahu anhu, he kept saying to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look, if you want money, sal, tu'ta, ask for it, we'll give it to you. I'll give it to you, you know, I'm rich. Uh, if you kill me, you just find I'm blood. You know, I'm blood, I'm fl flesh and bones, I'm just a human being. And if you set me free, then, you know, you'll find me thankful to you. So, you know, I won't show the same enmity as I used to show to you before. Now, this is a man who wanted to kill the Prophet ﷺ, who showed great enmity towards Islam and the Muslims. Now, this was the Prophet ﷺ's judgment. He decided to treat that man in that way. Huh? I'm not saying the people are trying to kill us, we say, Fadda, come and have my dinner. But I'm just saying, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, his priority was guiding people, saving them from the hellfire. And he saw something, he knew something, that this person could be guided. Now, the people that we need to be good to, the people that we need to set a good example to, they're not trying to kill us. They're not trying to harm us. Generally, we're talking about our fellow students at school. We're talking about our colleagues at work. We're talking about our neighbors in our streets that we live in. The people that we come across, you know. We're talking about these people, normal people. Who we don't want that Yawm Al Qiyamah they stand up and say, Ya Allah, this Muslim, this one who used to go to the beard, uh, go to the masjid, he had his beard, he used to wear these Muslim clothes. He never spoke to me about Islam. He never told me about Islam. Or, even worse, you know, he had terrible manners, terrible akhlaq. This person put me off Islam. When I saw him, I thought, I don't want to be like them. No. We need to be how the Prophet ﷺ really was. And so when you, when you speak about the role of the Muslim in the West, then it's exactly the same as the role of the Prophet ﷺ. So then what we all need to do is to study the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Study the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Before that, study the Qur'an. Because the Prophet ﷺ was a living example of the, the Qur'an. And that is it. And this thing will never change. And no matter which place we're in, it won't change. The role of the Muslim is always the same. To implement the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Now, when we do that, SubhanAllah, because sometimes we don't want to do some of these things, or we're scared to do some of these things, because of what might happen. <coughs> but SubhanAllah, we have to keep in mind the ayah of Allah Azza wa Jal. Do the people think that they're going to be left to say, we believe? Huh? Do Muslims, do believers think that they're going to be left to say, we believe? And that they're not going to be tested? Of course you're going to be tested. So if you want to be a believer, there's going to be tests. Things are, unpleasant things are going to happen. Huh? This, there's no way of getting out of this. If we think that, subhanAllah, if I stay quiet and I don't really go out there, and, you know. <laughs> you will be tested if you're a believer, number one. Number two, what kind of Muslim is this? That he, he wants, he's trying to run away from the tests. When we see the, the Prophet وسلم, and the Sahaba and the Prophets and Messengers before him, the most beloved people to Allah Azzawajal test him the most. You know, subhanAllah, one of the um, brothers, he was speaking to me about someone who was very beloved to him in these times. And how this person is being tested. May Allah Azza wa help this person and relieve his suffering. But we know Muslims like this all around the world. There's brothers and sisters suffering all over them. In Syria, in Somalia, in Mali, Afghanistan, Iraq. Brothers in prisons here in America, everywhere. Muslims are suffering. And this person was having a bit of, you know, they, they were feeling sad. They were feeling, subhanAllah, what is going on? These good people, and they're suffering like this. And subhanAllah, one uh, brother, he reminded us that subhanAllah, look, the people now, <laughs> are we better than or more beloved to Allah than the prophets and messengers? Look how they were tested. Okay, let's look at one woman. One woman who will put all 
us brothers to shame. The wife of Fir'aun, Asiya radiallahu anha, may Allah have mercy on her. This woman grows up in the house of Fir'aun. So she's accustomed to the luxury, the palace, the jewels, the wealth. You know, and this is what people want from this dunya. Hmm? And she's, a, she's used to all of this. She has all of this. But she accepts the message of Tawheed. And subhanAllah, she is then take, punished for this. It is said that she was taken outside and pegs were put into the ground and her arms and legs were tied to these pegs. And she's left out in the sun. But Allah Azza wa Jal sent the angels to shade her. And when she made dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. Najini. Huh? She makes dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. Oh Allah, you know, build for me a house close to you and save me from Fir'aun and his people. And said that Allah Azza wa Jal showed her her place. And then, subhanAllah, she is killed by them. She is ripped apart. We look at Ashab al huh? Either you follow our way or you jump in the fire. And they choose to jump in the fire. We see uh, Khabbab ibn al-Arat, his companion, he was a slave. He was bought uh, as a slave, as an investment. Um Azmar, this woman, she bought him so that he could work and make money for her. So she turns him into a blacksmith. And he makes swords and knives and he becomes good at it. He becomes Muslim. Very early on, he became a Muslim. So then the Quraysh, they decide, whoever has slaves that became Muslim, you deal with your slaves. So Umar Ma and her brothers, they go to deal with Khabab. And they beat him up unconscious. Another time she sees him, she hits him over the head with a hot iron rod. He faints. SubhanAllah. And in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, he once exposed his back to the Sahaba, and they were shocked at what they saw. You know, it's all burnt. It's, it's like holes in his back. And he said, I will be taken and put on hot coal until, you know, it would cool. And that's what did this to my back. This same Sahabi, when he went to the Prophet وسلم, and he complained, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, make dua. <laughs> the Prophet وسلم, said to him, you know, you guys are impatient. There were people before you the metal combs were brought and dug into their hands or dug into their bodies, wherever it was, and the flesh was ripped from their bones and they would stay firm on their deen. They would stay firm upon their la ilaha illallah. So look at these examples. The role of the Muslim in the West is to, the first part we already said, follow the Quran, follow the Sunnah, follow la ilaha illallah, all of that. Implement the sunnah, implement not just the beard and the thaw, but all the internal parts. And then know that you will be tested. And when the test comes, we have to stay firm. So this, nobody is coming to rip our flesh off. But subhanAllah, yeah, there are Muslims around the world being tortured, electrocuted, or waterboarded, huh? or their families being killed, being displaced from their homes. Yesterday in Syria, they said 141 were killed. Going to these refugee camps, they're, they're running out into every country around Syria. I mean, that's, these are just a couple of examples, but you know it's happening everywhere. Day before yesterday, I was reading in the BBC how Muslims are being uh, attacked in Sri Lanka. Out of the blue, you know, nothing's happened there. They're a minority, they're not saying anything, they're not doing anything special. But now uh, there's these like, militant Buddhists and they say these Muslims, they you know, attack our way of life. They're, they're, and, and they're spreading rumors. I mean, even the BBC article <coughs> is saying that they're spreading rumors, false rumors, that there's no, bed, uh, no evidence for nothing. And they're going at, around attacking masajid, uh, beating up Muslims. These things are happening everywhere. And so these tests will come. The Muslim has to stay firm. And if, like I said before, if we don't build a relationship with the Qur'an now, when we have a chance, things are okay for us. If we don't build our relationship with our salah, we're not praying, we're not thinking about what we're saying when we're praying, if we're not doing dhikr, 
then when those hard times come, we're not going to be able to face those hard times. When those Sahaba stayed firm despite what happened, it was because their Iman was so high. We won't be able to face those tests. We won't be able to stand up to those tests. And so inshallah, you know, this is, this is what I wanted uh, the brothers to keep in mind. The, the role of the Muslim in this society, in these times, is the same as it was before. That we need to try and implement the Qur'an and Sunnah in our lives. We need to learn them first. Then we can implement them. Then we need to take this deen. We need to take, take this deen to around all the non-Muslims and Muslims that we come across. Not be shy about it, not be scared that something might happen. And know that if you call yourself Muslim, if you want to be a believer, then tests will come. And when those tests come, we have to be firm, we have to deal with them in the right way, in the best way, yeah. in the way that the Sahaba did. And subhanAllah, if you want to look at uh, examples of thabat, of steadfastness, there's so many we could look at. We mentioned some already. Yeah? We, in the lives of all the Sahaba, we can see so many tough situations that they went through. Where they had to face up to their own families in jihad. Where they suffered so much. And they stayed firm. They stayed steadfast. And so this is the message. That we need to learn those things. We need to implement those things. And this is what we need to do. And more and more Muslims are finding ways to do this. I mean, on our local level, we all need to figure out new ways. Um, at the school where I teach, we were approached by an organization. Uh, it's a Muslim organization. This organization, they uh, put together a course for secondary schools. And um, basically this course, it teaches about uh, financial and social responsibility. So it teaches the children about zakat. Normally we read zakah, we read about it in books and it tells you this is what it is and this is how much you have to give. But this is more practical. It teaches you how to calculate it, what to do, you know, who, could, who you can give it to, who you can't give it to. So make it, uh, you know, bring it to life. And then there's the social responsibility. What is our responsibility to everyone and everything around us? And so what they did is, as part of the course, they made links with different organizations. <coughs> So they made a link with uh, RSPCA, you know this organization for prevention of cruelty to animals. Now we had this meeting with them and one of the brothers, he asked the RSPCA uh, representative, do you, uh, you know, have a, any objections to halal meat, you know, slaughtering animals? And the person said yes. Um, and you know, the person was honest, they said yes. And we even speak to the government about getting it banned. So the RSPCA, they actually do lobby the government. They do write to the government. They do speak to the government about um, having halal meat made illegal. Now, what the brothers did is they, they looked at certain, some of the other campaigns that the RSPCA are running. And they said, I mean, they spoke to some ulama, and they said, look, in this particular campaign, there was, there was one particular campaign that they run. They said, we'll cooperate with them on this. Even though, on one hand, they, you know, they object to this. They said, why? Because we want these opportunities to interact with them. We want these opportunities to do things with them so that we can show them where our side, where we're coming from. And so they work on campaigns with them. There's another one, the Salvation Army. I don't know if you, many of you have heard of it. It is a Christian organization. You know, they give <laughs> Christian da'wah. Yeah? They call people to Christianity. Now, they have shelters in this country, in, in almost every area you go. You, if you Google it, you'll find it. There's probably one in this area. There's one in Crystal Palace near where I live. People, homeless people, can walk off the street, come into their shelters, and they'll give them food. <coughs> now, they do have you know, when they speak, they give, you know, little Christian reminders, things like this. Now, subhanAllah, when uh, 
the brothers, they decided they're going to work with them, even though it's a Christian organization. They went in, they said, you know, how they are dressed in their shalwar kameez or, uh, you know, so. And he said they were, the people were affected, you know, affected that these Muslims are coming. And they're bringing food, they're bringing help. That was one thing. So it was, it was very good that way that we're not just all those terrible things that you see in the news and in the media. Huh? That Muslims are human beings as well. But subhanAllah, the, the thing that was shocking to them, the first group who did this, is that they said when they went to the Salvation Army Center, the first center that they went to, they said maybe 30% or something, you know, the very high percentage, whatever it was, were Muslim in that center. One Muslim came up to them and said, uh, SubhanAllah, this is the first time I've seen Muslims helping us here. All the help that we get is from the non-Muslims. All the help that we're getting is from the non-Muslims. They're the ones that are giving us the hot food and the donations to us and things like this. You know, there's so many things that we need to be getting involved in. Um, there's another organization now, they're trying to collect zakat and really educate people in spending the zakat around here, in this country. Because they said, they use one example. They said, uh, well, many examples. But one is um, sisters. They, they got in their brochures, they printed it. There was one sister, she came close to selling herself, to take care of her children. And Alhamdulillah, they said that somehow she got in touch with them before she made that mistake, or she fell into that. And Alhamdulillah, they helped her. And recently, they've opened up a shelter for sisters in Clapham. So they, you know, there's, there's rooms there for them to sleep in, and you know, kitchens for them to do things. So all of these things, they need help, they need support. Um, another thing they were saying is that when Muslims get let out of prison, there's a period between them coming out of prison uh, where they can't apply for any benefits or anything, and they, they, they're given very little money. It's not enough for them to survive. So many of them, they, got, you know, they fall straight back into crime. So again, trying to have, find ways to, to help them. And so we all need to look at our community or whatever it is, whatever skills we have and think, how can I engage in this society? How can I be like the Prophet was? When he saw Ahl al-Sufa, he didn't just leave them alone. He would speak to the Sahaba. First he paired them off, Mu'akha. Then after that, there were still some of the Sahaba, you know, there were people in... Uh, there were Ahl Sufa who he would say to the Sahaba, who's going to take them, who's going to feed them, who's going to... And all the time, even when Fatima radiallahu anha comes and asks the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for a slave, he says there are people that are more deserving, you know, that need my help more than you do. SubhanAllah. And so we need to do this inshallah. We need to find out how can we, we can engage in this society, how we can show the face of Islam the true face of Islam. And so in that, there's nothing unique and nothing new for the Muslim in the West. It's exactly the same as how the Prophet and the Sahaba were. And that's how it's going to be, inshaAllah. And with that, I'd like to end, inshaAllah. SubhanAllah, we have the question of Allah in the first step of the book. What do you do? Thank you. Thank you. We'd love you to have it, to stay with us until the uh, open discussion later on. But uh, that's just because we need to discuss this issue that you mentioned with uh, some brother that experience within the, the work that you just mentioned. Uh, so we'll see, inshallah, if you do generous of each other, stay on later on. But I'll leave you with uh, some questions if the brothers have questions or the sister can write in and send a question as well. So if anyone have a question? Any questions from the room? Uh, how best Shaykh can we implement uh, the area for as far as this is? And then have a war and uh لأن هاك مرة عن اللي بيلا نقاط هو في الدين. هاك مرة ما تقصد اللي. how best can we implement such a idea? طيب. I mean, if you سلام 
so the, 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 uh, the question is, how can you implement the ayat, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلكم في الدين? In Surah um, Al-Hashr, no, not Hashr, Muntahid. Muntahid or Hashr? Muntahid. Allah Azza wa Jal says, لا ينهاكم الله عن لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم. That Allah Azza wa Jal does not stop you, does not uh, prevent you from being um, just and kind and fair with those people that are not fighting you, are not killing you, and are not driving you out of your home. Previously, having spoken about that uh, this is not the, how the believer, the Muslim should be with those that are doing those things to you. So, if uh, a person is fighting you, you know, we, we don't have the, the Christian um, teaching of turning the other cheek. No, the Muslims, we stand up and we defend ourselves, and even if it's not with us, if it's happening to our brothers and sisters, we stand up and we defend our brothers and sisters. Now some uh, of the uh, ulama, some of the scholars, they said that this ayah is uh, abrogated. And so, from, from the, uh, based on the ayah of um, Surah Tawbah, which speaks about the party of Mushrikeen. Okay, so that's one opinion. But then there are others. The, the other opinions are that no, it's not abrogated, that we should continue to show kindness and uh, fairness and justice to the kuffar who are not fighting us, uh, who are not driving us out of our homes. Um, and so that's it. You know, you need to look at how to do that yourself. Okay, if we look at on a practical level, you live in a normal street in this country. You have neighbors. Yeah. Um, from time to time, send things to them. You know, maybe. I mean, it depends. You need to uh, uh, see the custom, what it is. Now, in the in, in this country, it's not normal to do that. If you're living in Egypt or Pakistan or Somalia, it's very it's probably usual for you to make a dish and you take the dish to your neighbor, and you give it to the people in your street, and you share with them. You know, maybe you could do things like that. I I know a, a couple in this country, and they lived in a street with non-Muslims. You know, one. Uh, in front of them there was an English couple and they were quite friendly to them and uh, there was a Nigerian uh, person who lived a few doors down and he used to be quite friendly, say hello and smile at them. So in Ramadan one time they made food and they shared it with all of them. Yeah? And you know they really liked it. That was the relationship they had with their English neighbours in this country. Um, so yeah, you need to judge what you can do. Maybe it's just smiling at them. Yeah? Maybe it's uh, giving them something. Maybe a box of chocolates, that's what they normally do here. Huh? Um, in East London, the brothers, they started doing uh, more active initiatives. So what they did is they started uh, cleaning up the area. East London, they said, look, some of the streets, they're dirty. It's not nice. So they started going out and doing, you know, cleaning the litter and sweeping up and doing things, you know, actively doing things to, you know, for the community. And so, yeah, you need to see which of these things you can do. I mean, if we look at the example of uh, the Sahaba going and help, cooking for the elderly and cleaning their houses and uh, feeding the poor amongst the Sahaba, uh, all of these things, I mean, there's nothing that says that we can't do these things. But in our own situations where we are, we need to find out which of these things we can do. And you might have a situation where, look, it's very easy for us to, uh, <laughs> Where I work, we have this neighbor, okay, uh, and this neighbor hates Muslims, okay. And all the time, you know, he's, he's got some problem. He, he, he complains about things. Now it's very easy for me or anyone else to get angry and think, how can we do things against him? How can we complain about him? Things like that. But one brother at work, mashallah, he he said to everyone that uh, one time when we had an incident, he said, look, he, he's our neighbor. So now, at work we have a big driveway, and uh, on the days where you know it's holidays, he takes his car and he parks it. Now, if we wanted to be difficult like he is, we would have said, Look, don't park your car here, cause trouble, things like that. But now, this brother in the admin office, he leaves him, he lets him park in there, things like this. You know, so li little things like this, <coughs> when people behave like that, and, and you get that, 
when a person, um, my, uh, my, my sons were telling me, they were with my uh, wife one day, they're driving along, yeah. and one day he spat at the car. Mm -hmm. Now what are we going to do? Are we going to turn around and start swearing at them, and cursing them, and behaving that way? You know, how are we going to conduct ourselves? So th these are the things that we have to think about. Often we speak about the Sunnah, and we speak about the Quran, and we speak about the Sahaba, and we feel, mashallah, it's wonderful, it's brilliant. Then when we go out on the street, we forget all of that and we turn into, <laughs> like, you know, how people are here in this country. We have to try and maintain our deen. That's, how, that's why first we have to put that deen inside us, and then we can take it out. Then we can give it to other people. You know, and we're, we're all struggling, we're all fighting. You know, I, uh, <laughs> even at home, I'll get angry at my kids, and I'll do things, I'll say things to them, and, uh, you know, I apologize to them often, and I say, SubhanAllah, look, you know, this is not the sunnah of the Prophet this is not how he would be. But, you know, we're all struggling, we're all, we're all fighting. So we try to do what we can, inshallah. Yeah. Um, any other questions? <coughs> yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'll repeat it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. go ahead. Well, uh, sometimes you come across people on the street and they ask you for, for a change or for a small money. Mostly non-Muslims and uh, people who abuse alcohol or drugs and or soon if it's counted towards sadaqa or if if you give them something a pound or so. I mean, you you the brother is asking, uh, is it sadaqa to give uh, charity to non-Muslims? Yes. yes. I mean, it depends on your intention. If your intention is to inshallah give them that or show them that we are. You know, just like the example I use of the woman on the bus. You know, if your intention is to give them da'wah, then inshallah Allah Azza wa will reward you for that. Um, but if you know definitely this person is going to be buying alcohol with it somehow, then obviously it's not a good idea to be given them. But sometimes shaitan, he does this to us. You know, he makes us think. So I'll give you an example. Uh, one brother, he went to Saudi. He went for Umrah. And uh, every time he saw people asking for money, he gets ideas in his head. So he said, you know, Shaitan says to him, how can this, uh, this guy, he says he's just come from Egypt. He's dressed well, he's saying he's lost his money and everything. But, you know, he looks fine. I don't think he's honest. I'm not going to give him anything. Then some Pakistani couple come to him, same thing. We came to the country, we came from Umrah, now we lost our things. He's like, look, the same person. Another person used the same story. These people can't be genuine, I'm not going to give him. I'll give it to some other people, inshallah, people that deserve it. Then he comes across the, the people, you know, they've got limbs missing and things. And he's, again, he makes the excuse in his head, subhanAllah, look, they've done this deliberately. This is like a business for them. They're always here. But I'll give it to some other people, inshallah, needy people. And his whole nearly Umrah trip has gone like this. And then, subhanAllah, uh, one day, the last day, his, mashallah, nice expensive iPhone, it's stolen from him during Tawaf. It's stolen from him during Tawaf. And uh, SubhanAllah, he's thinking about this, that you know, he, he's lost so much. And he wouldn't give Sadaqa when he should have. He shouldn't have been thinking like this, that you know, what's their intention? Allah is going to ask us to give. Huh? Uh, those that come and ask us, SubhanAllah. That same brother, when he went another time, he said that everyone that would ask him now, he would give to them. Everyone that would ask him now, he would give. Even if it was something little, just even one riyal, but he would give. Alhamdulillah. Now, on this trip, where he was giving, he said that he had more expenses. That, that trip, he didn't have a family with him. This trip, he's got family with him and other things. And subhanAllah, he said he had more money left over on this trip than he had the last time. Forget about the losing the phone, but still. Out in terms of money he spent and what he had left over, he ended up, he doesn't know how. This is the barakah that Allah Azza wa puts in our world. Even though he was giving to every person that asked, somehow he spent less than he did the previous time. Somehow he had more money left over than he did the previous time. Now, you can't explain it by calculating it on a piece of paper. 
because this is the barakah of Allah Azza wa that he, he will put into your actions. So, yaqi, we should just do khayr. Do khayr, inshallah. Don't think that you know they might do this or they might do that. Because once we let shaitan open that door, he'll always try and stop us from doing khayr. Um, <coughs> you know, even if it's something, just give something. Give them 20p, 50p, whatever. Come. But let them see the generosity of the Muslims. We, we have our intentions. And that is what Allah Azza wa will judge us upon. Our intention. Inshallah. Um, uh, have we brought that question? Yeah, yes. first of all, Bismillah here for your time, brother. Well, yeah. I, uh, uh, as, as you mentioned, the role of, of, uh, of a Muslim in the West, one of the roles is the da'wah, obviously, yeah. which I think is the most important one as well. Mm. I, I work mainly with English people and uh, they, they, they're well distant from the religion to start with, like, you know, from Christianity. And when it, uh, they're, they're very nice people to talk to and they listen to you with regard to the thing, but there is no reaction. You yeah. find them ignorant at the end of the day. Yeah. And after so many trials and trials and trials, somehow you find yourself in diverted from the Dawah and then you talk on other subjects with them. So how, how, how is the best way to do with, with kind of this kind of thing? Um, the brothers say that the main thing should be da'wah, uh, but sometimes you see people, they're not interested, so what do you do? The Muslim should live his life in a way that it, nothing changes. Yani. You're generous, you stay generous. You don't just do it you know, for five, when you first meet a person, and if, they don't, if they're not interested in Islam, khalas, I'm not generous no more. We live according to the Quran and Sunnah, and that stays constant. You know, we live that way normally. So, in terms of da'wah, da'wah isn't just speaking to them. So you met them, you spoke to them, and that was you giving da'wah, and now it stops. No, you being considerate all the time, you being polite, you being generous, you being nice, all of these, this is da'wah, and it can be continuous. And sometimes they may accept it and become Muslim, sometimes they may not. But what you may be able to do is show them and impress upon them that how Muslims are and make them at least uh, less hostile towards Muslim. Or make them you know, even like Muslim. Huh? Because of the way you are and the way you remain. And that you weren't, you know, one of the things is they'll think, you're not genuine. If you behave nice in the beginning because you're trying to make them Muslim and then after that you become not nice to them. They say, look, this person was just acting like that to get something from me, and now I'm not responding to them, so they change. You know, now they're treating me this way. No, we, we remain constant. You know, inshallah, that those good characteristics we always have, we always display to them. Um, and when when we say about people not becoming Muslim, not interested in the deed, okay, that that happens. There are a lot of non-Muslims in this country, but subhanallah. There are people becoming Muslim all the time. You know, there's all these stories on YouTube and on the internet about people and their stories about becoming Muslim. Um, last month in Lucia, uh, when I, I went there and in the, the first you know, five days of the month or something, there were 13 shahadas. You know, we've got so many stories of how that one brother, he became Muslim. Uh, actually, recently, there was a, a brother, he found uh, Imam Shaheed at uh, and Imam Shaqeen is in a, he's in a battle question, so he says, look, I, I can't come down, I'm in Redbridge, you know, to Lucian. So um, he phoned me, he said, Ahi, can you come down? I said, uh, what's the matter? This brother, he has a twin. His twin brother uh, is in uh, Egypt now, Ilyas. Okay? I'll, I'll say the names, it makes it a bit easier too. Ilyas is in Egypt, he's studying. His mother's English, his father was, I think, Jamaican. So, complete non-Muslim family. Ilyas became a Muslim, and after Ilyas became a Muslim, mashallah, he's, you know, he took to the deen. So he's now gone to Egypt to study. Before he went to Egypt, he was giving da'wah to his twin brother. His twin brother became Muslim. His twin brother became Muslim, his twin brother had a girlfriend. His twin brother said to his girlfriend, I can't be with you, you're, you know, I'm a Muslim. His twin brother's girlfriend became a Muslim, they got married. Before he traveled, uh, their mother became Muslim. So you've got now the two brothers, the girlfriend and the mother uh, of the two brothers, she became Muslim as well. 
Now, I've known them for quite a while, I think at least two years. So a few weeks back, a, few, a couple of months back, this call came, and it was the brother saying, Akhi, I need you to come down, because now my sister wants to take Shahad. You know, this was after Isha Salah at night. He said, look, she wants to do it. I don't want to delay it until tomorrow anything. Please, can you come to the masjid, and we'll, we'll, we'll just do it now. So subhanAllah, we went to the masjid, and uh, <laughs> she took her Shahad. And there's so many families like this. So the Muslim should never, ever lose hope. You know, subhanAllah, I was listening to the, uh, the tafsir of Sabbah alillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi wa huwa la azizul hakim. That everything in the heavens and the earth, everything is glorifying Allah Azza wa And Shaykh uh, Yasir Burhami from Egypt, he said, look, sometimes we get a bit depressed, we get a bit sad, that subhanAllah, we're only a few Muslims. That we're so small in number. And, you know, the, the, the kuffar are more. The, the awliya of shaitan are much more. We're so few. And, you know, we're being beaten and we're being killed and we're being, all of these things, yeah? And he said, this is how some Muslims feel. But he said, when you look at this ayah, everything in the heavens and the earth He's glorifying Allah Azza wa Jal. He's saying how perfect Allah Azza wa Jal is. And he's doing what Allah Azza wa Jal wants it to do. He said, when you look at this ayah, then you realize, forget about these a few billion human beings. There are trillions and trillions and trillions of insects, and stones, and rocks, and meteors, and stars, and planets. All of these are on the side of the believers. All of these are with the believers glorifying Allah Azza wa So never think, you know, subhanAllah, these people aren't becoming Muslim and they're not taking da'wah and, you know, we're, we're weak and we're, we're weak. We are the majority. Believers are the majority. Those that submit to Allah Azza wa are the majority. So we need to change our mindset. We need to change the way we look at things. And our job is to try and save as many of these people, convey the message to them. Not say, but convey the message to these people. So, inshallah, <coughs> may we be a means to their salvation. Inshallah. Uh, anything else? Any other questions? Say, inshallah. So, we'll end there. Subhanakallah, we'll be that shadow. And there, you got it. And that's the first thing to do. Okay, Brother, we'll have a bit of break, inshallah, until tomorrow time. A refreshment will be served.